<laughs> Hello, David. We see you. We hear you. Welcome. Yeah, excellent. Thank you, uh, Anand. It's been uh, sorry we're not seeing each other in person. Yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. It's been it's been a long time. <laughs> Has maybe, been a long time. Maybe, Probably maybe, a year, in fact. Maybe Feels next longer. year. Maybe next year we'll be able to see each other at the conference. <sighs> so, can you try to share your screen so we can check that your slides are okay? Uh, yeah, give me one second. I just make sure my presentation is in the right screen. Okay. All right. I'm going to quickly just rearrange my desktops, and uh, then I. Right. One second. I will share the, my presentation. We see your screen. You can hide the little toolbar. Perfect. Perfect. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so as uh, and I said, I'm David O'Neill. I am the CEO and founder of a company called API Metrics. Um, what we do is we monitor and measure the performance of APIs um, for a variety of companies across fintech, telco, banking, IoT, uh, really anybody who wants to understand how their APIs are performing. But one of the things that we've come to understand is it's less about engineering groups in 2020 needing to know how their APIs work, but actually being able to share that information and use it with other people. And this has got us uh, looking into essentially how do you agree common standards between organizations for trust in APIs? And why is this actually so hard to do? So I'm going to be. Um, going through some of the issues that we've encountered and some of the issues that you will encounter as you try to measure APIs in a meaningful way and have some thoughts and suggestions on why this is problematic, particularly in regulated API spaces like banking and healthcare. And uh, I'll give you some indications of the approach we're taking towards it, but also my thoughts on what we as an industry need to do about this, because it is hard. And as you look at a space where entire business ecosystems rely on the performance of others and not just themselves. You need to have an agreed way of accepting whether partner A is meeting the obligations you wanted them to have versus what they believe from their own internal systems. So moving on, um, I used to give an API uh, talk called In Search of Schrodinger's API. I think that was what I called it last year. Um, Basically, if you're not familiar with Schrodinger's, uh, the Schrodinger's cat experiment, I'm sure everyone is, but it's a um, facet of quantum physics that if you put a cat in a box with a random event that could kill it or not kill it, you don't really know whether the cat is alive or dead until you open the experiment and take a look. And this is one of the problems we see with uh, monitoring APIs, that you can have, you can devise ways of monitoring your APIs that can give you a fairly rosy picture of how everything is going from the point of view of what you are measuring. But it may not give you very much indication of how things are working for your uh, actual users or for third parties who are interacting with an API through your API stack. And this is where it becomes challenging, that without uh, having an agreed way of measuring quality and an agreed uh, set of standards for how you approach measuring that quality, you can have quite bitter and, in some cases, if it's a regulated situation, expensive conversations with regulators over who is telling the truth. And I'm going to give a recap of my thoughts on why measurement is hard and some of the things you should do, and then talk uh, for the last, second half of the, the, my presentation on issues of trust, why those issues exist, and some thoughts on what we should and could be doing about them. So um, let's not play uh, rock, scissors, uh, lizard, Spock and get into common things we hear about API uh, quality conversation. So first thing, um, mostly we hear from customers or regulators, doesn't our insert whatever here cover this? And it could be our gateway, it could be our APM stack, um, it could be a logging tool they installed for web services. This is also made complicated by some of the regulators in different parts of the world 
essentially not understanding that an API is not a web call and asking for them to be tracked and monitored in the same way, which can lead to confusion because APIs don't look or behave like, uh, they just look a little bit like web calls, but they're not the same. And it adds a second problem, which is uh, particularly with gateways and some of the infrastructure elements that provide logging, do you take the people supplying you with the infrastructure at their word that everything is working correctly? And there's a, an idiom in English, which is, do you let the fox guard the hen house? Because foxes do love hens, um, but they love them a bit too much and might not be trusted to do it properly. It's essentially the same with IT. Monitoring, um, monitoring the infrastructure you have sold somebody, often for a quite large sum of money, doesn't always lead to negative, uh, negative reporting. It often actually leads to the opposite. You know, our infrastructure is fine, it must be something else. Now that might be true, but the issue is, can you prove it? And could you prove it to a regulator? So some of the things we see, and I think this will touch on some things that um, Dominic mentioned in his uh, talk from Mosif that I just caught. Um, there are lots of problems that can happen with APIs that tend to get uh, get missed. So one example, uh, if you just look at HTTP codes as they go through your gateway without looking at the content that came back, um, you can end up in a... Um, kidding yourself that things are good. This is two identical API calls. One was a failure, one was a pass. Essentially, unless you actually read and reviewed the packet, uh, the content that came back, you would not know that one had failed and one had, uh, had actually passed. And a lot of APIs still, even in 2020, always return a 200 OK code. So um, not to uh, not not to to mock um, the slogan of another uh, API monitoring company, but there are lots of times when 200 is not OK. So first of all, you do need to check the, the packets. And sometimes that may not be easily, easy to do. You certainly may not be able to do it easily in real time, um, particularly if you've got high volumes. And you can end up in a situation where someone can show you that you have been failing and it's not been apparent to you. In the case I've got here, this was a, about 5% of all API traffic was returning a 200 failure until they, they analyzed it and found out what was wrong. And in this case, it was a REST uh, SOAP API had been hidden behind a REST wrapper, which is not an ideal way of doing it, but very common in financial services. Um, second problem is specs and schemas. Um, if you look at some regulatory regimes, uh, Australia, for example, uh, open banking, uh, the open banking implementation entity in the United Kingdom, um, they specify what the, what schema should, should apply and how the schema should be used in the API calls themselves. To the point that um, in this example, an application, uh, ex uh, the accept header has to have the actual um, schema, schema specified in it. In this, in this example, if you specified the schema as per the spec, you would get a 406 error from the API. If you just had text, uh, text or JSON as the accept header, the API call would pass. So while the API would pass and would return content, and you could make an argument, as the bank have or did, that that was acceptable, it was out of scope with what the regulator was regulating. If this, if this is a, a a regulated fire API in healthcare or an API where there are specifications on it must contain this many fields, these fields must contain this type of data and validating that, you can have a situation where you're not actually returning what the specification says and be open to fines without realizing it for yourself. So again, you need to actually look at what is returned and validate that it is doing what you think it is. And again, not the easiest thing to do from the inside, not the easiest thing to do in real time on all of your transactions. So again, you need to have logging and monitoring set up that actually allow you to do that. Um, third problem is latency. Um, essentially, there are lots, the problem with latency is there are so many different ways of measuring it, it becomes very hard to agree on standards between different parties. So what are you actually measuring? Where are you measuring it from? And how are you taking that measurement? Um, I'll use one example. I, use, I, I, I often give almost an entire talk on this because it's, um, if you're into stats, it's a fascinating topic. Um, but it's eight o'clock in the morning where I am, and I haven't had enough coffee to do that. So we're skipping most of it. But this is, um, this is an example from an open banking regulator that they log um, uh, a metric called time to first byte. And they define time to first byte as the difference between this T1 point and the T6 point where the request has arrived at the gateway 
and uh, the gateway has responded and sent the first byte back to the end user. There's a lot of problems with this approach in general. Um, your gateway will, what your response is at the gateway will bear very little resemblance to what your client response is once you've added in um, issues with DNS, um, TCP connect times, data transmission rates across the public cloud. The internet is not magical. It doesn't work on a quantum interference level where everything is instantly transmitted. You can have lag, you can have delays. In your cloud data center, a noisy neighbor can, can add latency to you. Not to mention if you're working with a bank and they have a, a new secure, they have a security layer in front of their load balancer, um, some of the cloud data centers don't interact nicely with that. And we've seen lags as much as two and a half seconds per transaction just getting through the bank security infrastructure. But as far as the bank was concerned, everything was responding within tens of milliseconds. For the external users, some were experiencing two or 3,000 milliseconds. So this is, a, this is a problem in and of itself. And it's really only solved by measuring uh, performance from where the clients are and um, looking at what they're getting back. But there was another problem, which is this time to first byte metric. It turned out it's really easy to game. And if you know, for example, that the first byte you will always return unless the call completely fails and returns nothing is going to be a H. Um, the first response, the first byte res response from any API call anywhere is HTTPS, HTTP. So some gateways automatically respond with a first byte and it comes back almost instantaneously, sub one millisecond. And that's very good, but it's not actually accurate. It just means that they know how the system should respond. And actually this metric, you could have everybody having a response within sub one millisecond, but it doesn't really make much difference. And if you look at the, uh, if you look at the response of this, um, there are reasons why you would do it. Uh, if we look at Box versus Dropbox, for example, Box and Dropbox, um, Dropbox takes in the query, processes the query and delivers everything after it's processed it, um, which takes two or 300 milliseconds usually. Box do the opposite. Box responds immediately, yep, I've got that request, processes it and starts sending, uh, and then sends stuff back afterwards. Box is actually slightly faster, but it, it the, the way it looks is it's instantaneous and then slow. And that, that, that's something that you just need to be aware of. And particularly if you set a metric as a regulator to measure that, don't set metrics that can be easily gamed. Uh, I think it's called Hart's Law, that if you set a, a metric, somebody will use that, the metric will become what is measured, not what you were intending to measure. Which brings me to sort of the, the core of my talk, which is why, why this trust matters, uh, particularly in a universe of regulated APIs, like we're we're moving into now. So look, if we look at uh, financial services, if we look at healthcare, if we look at open insurance, open government, people are building API contracts between many parties, which have real world and significant implications. Uh, whether it's loan applications, whether it's payments, people want to know that they can rely on the APIs to deliver what they have. And if you're in an ecosystem like banking, uh, your brand will depend on whether you're whether it is your API that you're fronting or one of the APIs that you're connected to that's causing problems. And you need to be able to not just prove that, but also articulate it and understand where the weak links in the chain might be. So if we look at something like the banking sector and you're a payment uh, or a API integration platform like Plaid, actually knowing that uh, a particular bank is down or a particular bank is unreliable, People aren't going to blame the bank if they can't use their Plaid connectors to do things. They will contact Plaid. So you need to know whether the services that you're connected to are reliable. Um, the second thing is, uh, and this is a, a suggestion for why we believe synthetic testing is so important in the API sector. A lot of DevOps and uh, DevOps engineering groups are very focused on, oh, well, I've got all the data in the universe here of every transaction. I can give you real metrics on what the transactions say. That is true. But if you're, in a, if you're in a very regional area, you're not going to have a lot of load or traffic at 2.35 in the morning. If something goes down at 2.35, you're going to probably learn about it the same time everybody else does when load starts to build at 6 or 7 in the morning. 
we're also uh, we've also seen situations where if you've got lesser used connectors, um, my favorite case is from North America, where we have a client who integrates to something called Redneck Bank in Tennessee. Um, they only had a few hundred uh, calls per month to Redneck Bank, but the people who call, wanted to transfer money or do things with Redneck Bank were very loud and tended to complain quite a lot. And they had no mechanism for knowing that Redneck Bank had been down effectively for a day because no one was calling it through their platform. So this, you need to trust the quality of the service being provided by others and have ways of articulating it and agreeing that that is an issue. So the first the first problem we see is is the we said they said fight um, in API contracts, particularly in financial services. It is extremely easy to turn up where both sides have a uh, have proved the other one is lying. So you need to have a common framework and a common language for agreeing who is actually telling the truth and what the truth looks like. And that should be uh, agreed common standards on where things are measured from, how things will be measured. When you're talking about latency, are you talking about medians? Are you talking about means? Are you talking about 95th or 99th percentiles? What, what are the common words that you use and are you using them in the same way? Because what one organization is doing from the gateway will be different to what one, another organization is doing from their APM logs. So first of all, you need to agree a common uh, language that you agree on prior to going into dispute resolution or into issues with regulators. Second piece is, did you actually try it yourself? Uh, there's a phrase used in software development, particularly North America, I don't know about the rest of the world, but it's eating your own dog food. Um, we recently did a project where we onboarded every um, open banking implementation entity regulated bank in the United Kingdom for a trusted third party. And there are about 38 of these. It took one day to onboard the first 18. We just set everything up as per what the documentation said. The next 10 took about six weeks just because the documentation missed out lots of steps. Things weren't actually documented. It needed different types of certificate. The certificates needed to be compiled in a slightly different way. And these are highly secure APIs that require a, a, a JOT signing process as well as MTLS and um, specialist scopes. So that took another six weeks to wait for responses and so on. The last 10 took another four weeks on top of that because they had literally left out steps in their documentation. Or worse, their documentation was PDFs. That they didn't, there wasn't. A, they didn't have examples online we could go and look at and test. They didn't have working live API documentation. So this is this is a critical step for everyone. Documentation that has not just has works, but actually um, can be shown to work. And I think uh, Postman and Kin Lane have been doing an amazing job in the last uh, the last few months on creating mock servers and collections that can actually be demonstrated and, and work. Um, it's more problematic when you get highly secure regimes like Open Banking UK, where you have to have a, a, a encryption key stored in a FIPS compliant data store, and it, it becomes more, it has more complexity. But at the very least, people should have somebody who didn't build their APIs, who isn't working inside the firewall, verify everything works. Next piece, and this is very common in a lot of regulatory regimes, is the organizations within them mark their own homework. Um, they essentially, um, your, you not only know, believe you know the subject, but your teacher doesn't actually know the subject, so they can't mark it themselves. And this is the situation with lots of regulators, that they don't have the insight or the technology available to do the marking. So um, don't mark your own homework. Don't rely on the logs from your own systems, which will probably tell you that everything's OK to tell you everything is OK actually put in place things that look for bad bad news. Uh, we, we've had complaints in our business from customers where their management are not happy that we find problems. They, they didn't want to monitor to find problems. They wanted to monitor to tell them everything was good. That's the wrong way of doing it, in, in my opinion. Um, the last key thing for this is there's a lot of move towards directories and directory structures that people use. Um, there's an element of uh, GIGO in this, so garbage in, garbage out. Um, directories are only as good as what's in them, but what is in them? Uh, what do they cover? It, you know, it's actually very hard when you start to do lots of onboarding of APIs to find things like common OAuth documentation. Uh, we've been working with a carrier in Africa, and they 
they have OAuth 2 protection on their APIs, but no one has documented how the OAuth 2 process works. You can manually get a token, but no one's included how the callback page works, how the refresh token works, all the steps that people need to know to, to securely co communicate with their APIs on a regular basis, they've just left out of the stack. So we need directories that we can trust that have things like proof that the APIs work, that the APIs are of good quality, have a trusted framework for what that quality means. So wrapping this up, because I'm, I'm conscious um, of time, uh, APIs are harder to measure than people think. And it's not something that you should do because, well, we should monitor it. It's something you should do because it's essential to your core business. Um, you've got to remember HTTP codes are wrong. It matters where you measure the API calls from. And you need to remember that cloud services are not the same. Um, you will see different performance from an Azure data center than you do from a Google or um, an, Am an Amazon one. Um, different data centers in different parts of the world will be loaded in different ways and have different performance profiles. We see a common pattern that a new data center is spun up in a new new region. And for the first few weeks, it's incredibly fast and works extremely well. But then everybody realizes they've got a local data center for testing and it becomes slow and cruddy as it gets overloaded and the cloud service provider has to add more capacity. We've seen that in India, we're seeing it in South Africa. So that's something to really understand. If you're in a containerized world, you really need to understand where in the where in the world you should be hosting things from and review that regularly. Just because everything worked very well in a data center in Iowa this week, doesn't say what it will do next week or the week after. You can't just rely on these things magically um, staying the same. Documentation is still very, very bad. We don't have common standards around what makes it good. Um, if you haven't looked at what Postman's doing with live editable collections, um, I would strongly recommend that. But outside of that, it's still generally very bad. We don't have mock servers. We don't have agreed ways of presenting security systems properly. It, it, it needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in, a, I think, a more rigorous way than we, the industry, are doing it. Uh, thirdly, as I mentioned, people haven't eaten their own dog food. Um, for anybody releasing an API into the wild, it's worth just having somebody who isn't a team member actually onboard your API and tell you what the experience was like. Just, just as a matter of uh, hygiene, um, you will find you will learn things you didn't expect. Um, for every Twilio out there, there's a company that threw out an API, put wrote a, wrote a Word document, stuck it as a PDF, and that is their documents. So. Don't do, go and look at how Twilio did it. Um, they, they, they had a gold standard early on and, and move on from that. And finally, we need to have independent rules on what the facts are that everybody agrees to. Really, um, coming back to this trust thing, we need, we need to understand what the basics of trust are and what we mean by trust. And we need to understand what we mean by quality, what we mean by performance, where knowing where we go to get things and how we police that are essential to the next evolution of the API ecosystem. And, you know, after all, nothing bad has ever happened in human history by industry self-regulation, has it? So I, I'm suggesting that we, we are becoming the essential linchpin of the economy around the world, particularly in times like this terribly weird and horrible year we've all had to sit through. And I'd much rather be in Paris giving this talk than looking at my webcam. But we need to address this as the industry, before the industry has a bad day where API failures make it to the national and international news, or even worse, have some kind of impact on the financial sector. So um, that's the headlines of what I wanted to communicate. Uh, finally, a plug, if you're interested in bringing standards to API quality, um, it's, it's our day job. And what we're trying to do with that is um, introduce scoring systems and metrics that everybody can rely on for looking at the quality of APIs. We're launching a premium version of a service we call api.expert. Um, feel free to go there and it's all free data all the time for the last week, but we'll be giving you access to performance data going back over, in some cases, two or three years. So you can actually see how APIs vary over time and some of the cloud data around it. So that's um, that's what I wanted to say. I think I was given 20 minutes. I may have just gone slightly over on that. So uh, any questions? Thank you very much, David. Uh, I think we have one minute for one question, and uh, I will ask it. Uh, do you plan to propose, or does it already exist, some kind of standard description of 
API metrics that everyone should use? Uh, will there be one day some kind of ISO certification or whatever to um, that API provider could use to say, okay, we provide good quality APIs and here's how you can trust us? Um, I would like to believe that we will. And I, I, I would like to, um, my, my belief would be we've invented a scoring system in API metrics we call CASC, C-A-S-C, Cloud API Service Consistency. And we'd like that to become a de facto standard for people to understand. The, the, the way CASC works is we look at, we've, um, we've patented our methodology for this just to, as the, the maths was quite hairy, but the idea is um, we don't take one data point for granted. We look at pass rates. We look at the statistical smoothness of the quality of the response times, and we look for outlier rates. And we blend that together in something that can be given given as a score out of ten, and that allows us to make apples to apples comparisons between different APIs. Whether it's Cask or whether it's something else, we do need to have a a metric uh, or, or a set of metrics from trusted providers like we have in the financial services industry, uh, which, to be honest, there have been problems with, as we learned in 2008. But the kind of thing that we have with an experience score or a FICO score or a Dun & Bradstreet score, I believe we need to have that for trust frameworks and APIs. We need to know why bank X is better than bank Y or why provider Z is better than provider W. And I, I do believe that that's something we need to get on top of. And I think that goes hand in hand with meaningful trusted directory structures. There's lots of API directories out there. Um, you know, it's actually relatively straightforward to set up an API directory. John Musser did it, well, how, how long ago did he set up programmable web? It's 10 years nearly, thereabouts. But without actually knowing what the quality of the services in that are, are, it's very hard for anybody to make a decision looking at a directory of uh, messaging APIs, which, which one do you use and why? Um, we need to agree those frame, we need to agree those standards. We need to have a mechanism by which everyone can say, yes, we believe that, that API is better or our service is better than these APIs. Or if you've got lots of APIs and you've got you want to actually have brand protection in that. You, you want to know where the problems for you are going to be in the quality of the services that you're, you're working with. So. Thank you very much, David. We